All right, welcome everyone and good evening. Um, we want to welcome you to our first annual, hopefully, uh, North American Cystic Fibrosis Conference update. We're glad that you're here with us tonight um, and we have a lot of exciting news to uh, to kind of share with you about what we learned in Denver. Um, for those of you who have not met me before, I'm Elizabeth Davies Wellborn. I am the social worker with the adult program here at ANOVA. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to talk about a few kind of housekeeping things. Uh, First of all, if everyone could make sure that their computers or their phone microphones are muted, that way we don't get any um, kind of feedback from our own presentation, that would be appreciated. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, there is um, this little uh, chat kind of symbol on the right side of your computer screen. You can just type any questions. At the end, we will answer them. Um, we will be sending out a survey following tonight's presentation, and that's just to help get feedback. So when we present in the future, um, we take into consideration all of the things that um, are relevant to you, but also making sure what we are presenting actually gets to you, which hopefully it is tonight. <laughs> um, and finally, we also will be sending out the PowerPoint presentation, so that way you have access to all the information and any links um, that might be within the presentation itself. All right, so now the rest of the team will be introducing themselves. Hi, good evening. Uh, Dr. Whitney Brown, um, the Adult Program Director here at the ANOVA uh, CF Center. I'm Quinn Duong. I'm the respiratory therapist on the team and working with the pulmonary rehab. Hi, I'm Erin Lipinski. I'm the new uh, registered dietitian nutritionist. I was unable to attend the conference this year, but I'm happy to share some nutrition pointers for CF. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Bowen. I am the CF program coordinator, aka nurse. Hi, my name is Lauren Marinak. I'm the inpatient nurse practitioner, and I take care of patients with cystic fibrosis, as well as patients that are post-lung transplant. So for the remainder of our presentation, we'll be switching over to our PowerPoint slides, but you'll still be able to hear our voices. So the first provider to present is our CF Center Director, Dr. Whitney Brown. Thanks, hi and good evening. We're thrilled that you guys have joined us and we just wanna share a little bit about what we learned in Denver back in October. Oops, here's my slide. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> I've met most of you, um, but for those who I haven't, um, I'm uh, Whitney Brown. So the first, um, mo probably one of the most exciting points of the conference this year was talking about CFTR modulators. And remember, these are pills that some patients can take that help their CF chloride channels work better all over the body. And I wanted to put up these, um, these pictures so we can be reminded what is out on the market and available to some of the patients right now. So we see Kalydeco or Ivacaptor is the first um, medication that was approved for about 9% of patients, and that's been on the market um, several years now. Then there was Orcambi, which is a combination of the Ivacaptor and Kalydeco, and then also Lumacaptor. And that's been approved, uh, I believe, since about 2014 in this country. And then lastly, and excitingly, this year, uh, Simdico is the most recently approved. It was approved by the FDA in February. And in that one, it's the Ivacaptor from Kaleidico, but instead of Lumacaptor, it's been replaced with Tezacaptor, which has, um, for some people, less side effects and less drug uh, interactions with other medications. So the buzz at this year's conference was an improvement upon the what we see with the um, Simdico. Uh, so it, it's what we're calling the triple. And instead of just two medications to correct the chloride channels, um, it involves three. And this triple combination is um, going to be designed for people with at least one copy of the most common mutation, the Delta F508 mutation, and would also apply to people with two copies. And so on the right here, I just wanted to remind us, it gets really complicated really fast thinking about the genetics and the protein, but just to remind us all that the CF, um, um, 
gene encodes the CFTR, which is a chloride channel. And here's a picture of the channel. It's the green things. And that's what sends um, chloride uh, to different parts of the body to hydrate it. And so um, when you don't have good chloride and sodium chloride and water transport through this area, then, um, muta then secretions can get sticky all over the body. So that's what we're talking about. With the Delta F508, it's a double whammy because the chloride channels don't get to the right place. And then once they're in the right place up on the top of the cells, they don't open and close correctly. So right now there's um, what um, one potentiator, which is the IvaCaptor, that helps it open and close correctly when it gets to the right place. And um, the approved medications right now, there's one corrector, which it would be the Tezacaptor or the Lumacaptor to help it get into the right place. But what the triple is, is using two medications to help the chloride channel get into the right place and then um, combining it with the IvaCaptor that we know has worked um, to help open and close it. So what um, Vertex is doing, and Vertex is the company that has made the other three medications, is they have two candidate drugs, what they're calling Vertex 445 and Vertex 659, and they are in phase three studies looking at um, at, at both of those medications in different studies combined with the Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, which is Simdaco. And they are thinking that triple combo um, would be even better than the approved double. And this data um, is hot off the press and was published actually the week that we were at the CF conference. And these, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is probably the most prestigious journal we have. And it's looking at phase two studies. Again, the combination, that I, the triple combination and two parallel phase two, studies and they looked very favorable and these were for people who were all you know all over the world over the age of 18 with at least one copy um, and they looked at lung function uh, which improved just in the short time of the study uh, improved by 29 days and they also looked at quality of life which is the cfqr and then the sweat chloride which um, which is sort of a a measure of how salty uh, the sweat is and a reflection of how the chloride channels might be working. So the timeline for the uh, triple combination is really exciting and moving quickly. And we um, know now the phase three, which is the last phase of clinical trials, uh, both uh, the 659 and the 445 have been fully enrolled. And they, in fact, um, just last week or about 10 days ago, announced that the 659 results were very favorable from the phase three. That's not the official publication, but that's a press announcement. And so what we're expecting is that Vertex is gonna pick one or the other of those medications, combine it with the Tezacaptor, um, um, Ivacaptor that's already approved in Simdaco and move forward to the FDA and ask for that triple combination to be approved. And approval could happen, it, it will be fast-tracked and could happen as early as next fall. And this, uh, this would be, like we said, people with one or two copies of Delta F, and it's going to be an expanded panel of people that have um, many other mutations on their second, um, on their second gene. So it's, it's going to impact more patients and be um, significantly um, more, uh, more effective even than the Simdaco or, or can be with, for some people, lung function improvements on the order of 10% improvement in FEV1. So stay tuned for this. And then lastly, um, Vertex has really dominated in this field as we hear with the, the three approved medications and now the triple, but there are other companies looking at um, triple combinations. And then we continue to look for uh, CFTR modulator therapy for every mutation um, for every patient that we have. So that is my news. And next, I'll let Quinn tell us about what's new in respiratory therapy. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I'm really excited to share with you some of the hot topics that was discussed at the conference this year relating to respiratory care. So the three uh, topics I'm going to share today are proper ways to clean your nebulizer equipment, airway clearance techniques, including um, exercise and then the importance of uh, exercise and palmer rehab in cystic fibrosis. So first off, nebulizer care. There are four different steps to properly clean your nebulizer equipment. The first step is to clean it. You want to wash it with warm water and mild soap. And then you want to disinfect it. These are two separate things. Um, there are two different methods um, to disinfect. You can either 
do the uh, heat method or the cold method. The heat method, you can just put in the dishwasher, you can microwave it using the baby bottle steamer, or even boil in hot water. Um, with the cold method, you have to soak it in the 70% alcohol for five minutes, or the 3% hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes. Now, if you decide to go with the cold method, remember you need to uh, rinse it over with sterile water. And you don't need to go out and buy sterile water. You can make them right at home. Boil a, a pot of hot water and then just kind of soak everything through after you soak it in the, the um, alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. Last but not least, air dry. Do not put any of your nebulizer equipment in a Ziploc bag while they're wet. You want to make sure you leave them out so they're completely dry before you store them. The CF Foundation have awesome videos on their website to talk about the proper way to clean the equipment. I encourage you to explore the website and kind of watch over step by step how to do it properly. So for the Altera or the eFlow nebulizer equipment, you do not want to microwave these or boil them. There are different um, instructions on how to clean them. They're also on the website, a uh, video, good video um, on the YouTube channel. So check them out. Moving forward, airway clearance techniques. Technology is really advanced nowadays, and there are so many different devices out there to help with airway clearance. But today I want to touch on two, maybe three different techniques that doesn't require any devices, it just requires you. The first one is called the active cycle breathing techniques, and this has three essential components. Your breathing control which is just normal breathing. Your chest expansion exercise means it just allow a, a bigger volume to expand your, your chest uh, thoracic cavity. And then followed by a huff cough or ex forced expiratory technique. This technique will allow you to squeeze out the air while keeping your mouth and glottis open. But remember, when you do this, you, only, you should only do two to three forced expiratory or huff cough at a time to prevent bronchospasm. And then the autogenic drainage. There are three stages to this uh, autogenic drainage. First of all, autogen autogenic drainage is a breathing exercise using controlled breathing and with different lung volume to move secretion from the smaller airways to the large airway so you can cough them up. The three stages are unsticking, collecting, and evacuating. Again, they're just different lung volume um, to help expand that your chest cavity and then get rid of the secretion. Some key points to remember, try to suppress your cough to the end of the third stage. And when you're exhaling, exhale fast, but not too fast to avoid wheezing or airway compression. And then you wanna listen for loose mucus before moving to the next steps. The autogenic drainage is pretty cool. They have um, app available for your smartphone. So you can go into your app store and download them. And I took a look at it, it's pretty cool. It provides timers and voice commands to help aid in doing this method. And of course, you can exercise. This is my favorite subject. With pulmonary rehab, we have a very unique CF pulmonary rehab program here at Inova. It is one-on-one -on -one individualized treatment plan designed to meet patient's goal. It's typically in eight weeks and twice a week with exercise and about 60 minutes each visit. Um, we have weekly education that can go up to 45 minutes added onto one of the exercise sessions. And we follow the CFF infection control guidelines very closely. While at the conference, I've talked to a few physical therapy and realized that their role is pretty important in helping us assisting our patients. As a clinic, we apply for the CF physical therapy grant and physical therapists help evaluate muscle and pelvic floor you know, weaknesses. And we hope that this grant will allow us the opportunity to work closely with them to optimize the pulmonary rehab therapeutic exercise program and develop a good regimen for our patient while they're here and at home. Thank you, and here's my good friend, Erin. Hi, everyone. So uh, just to touch on some hot topics for nutrition, um, when we think of nutrition, uh, we often think of weight. And as most of us know, it's often a struggle to maintain a healthy weight with CF. 
Um, this is due to a failure to digest and absorb nutrients and vitamins properly. Um, but don't be discouraged if you're struggling with weight gain. Um, there's many ways to maintain a healthy body mass index, um, which can lead to a higher FEV1, stronger bones, stronger immune system, and can reduce your length of stay in the hospital if, God forbid, you get sick. So for example, at a height of 5'7", for males, we'd want to aim for at least 150 pounds, females at least 140 pounds. Um, but remember, this is a minimum. It's ideal to give yourself a little wiggle room or cushion if you happen to get sick um, so you don't dip below that BMI of 22 or 23. <clears throat> so how do we make it easier to achieve your optimal weight and nutrition status? As many of us know, the frequency of eating small meals or snacks that pack a punch uh, of calories and protein um, one quick note, if everyone can mute uh, your phones, uh, just a little quick reminder. Thanks. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Here. I just want to ask, we can hear the uh, sound of, sounds like a young child. If you could mute your device, we'd appreciate it because it is interrupting the conference. Thank you. Perfect. I think, I think we're good. Um, so yes, so we want to make sure that the frequency of eating small meals or snacks that have a good amount of calories and protein, um, this is arguably the most important nutrition habit to form, um, so ideally thinking of munching every few hours. Uh, because with a combination of uh, enough calories, protein, and with weight-bearing exercise, we can all, um, you know, improve weight uh, through muscle. Um, but research says that individuals with CF need more protein than those without because of increased work of breathing, chronic inflammation, and exacerbations. In addition, it's particularly difficult to digest and absorb fats with CF, uh, so we want to include fats from avocado, cheese, butter, oils, whole milk, nuts, seeds, fish. There's all kinds of options to have at each meal um, to make sure that we're getting 35 to 40% um, percent of our calories from fat. It's helpful to, you know, to consider these different nutrients by um, reading food labels at the grocery store at home, um, looking them up at restaurants, um, or, you know, they have nutrition facts online for restaurants, or even better if you're able to understand um, how much and what you're eating through apps on your phone. Um, for example, Nutritionix is a tracking app um, similar to MyFitnessPal that uses the USDA database, um, and it can just make things easier. But most importantly, we want to have fun with eating, um, and even with staying hydrated. There's all kinds of fun brands now, like Life Water. I was talking to somebody the other day about um, vitamin water, bubbly water, or if you're feeling sassy and want to infuse your own water with fruit, um, that's an option. Um, because eating should be something that we honestly look forward to. Um, it's a time to take a break from what we're doing, kind of refuel, re-energize, time to be social. Um, and there's many fun ways um, to cook. There's all kinds of websites that can create or help you create menu planning um, tips, even for seasonal options. Um, it's often fun to try new recipes or if you don't really like cooking, getting someone we love to cook for us. Um, and it's helpful if we don't like to cook to have some rules of thumb, like um, cooking once to eat three or four times, um, buying in bulk to save money, using containers to store uh, meals in the freezer, um, and if it's not realistic uh, for some people um, to pack lunch or plan dinners for the whole week, at least thinking about things the night before or buying single package servings for snacks and meals um, to make things easy for grab and go. Uh, but luckily, CFF.org has a lot of printouts, such as this link I've included, which offers tips for making eating frequently a little easier and help you to become a little more organized. Um, because the more you stick to a plan that works for you, the easier it is to have it turn into a habit. Yes, so on this slide, I've included the poo emoji um, for a chance to mention that we all poop, so um, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. Um, let your team know if you've had any changes in digestive patterns. I'm happy to help you with food choices to alleviate any symptoms you're experiencing with antibiotics um, or you know different symptoms. Um, there's certain foods, such as fruits and vegetables, grains, that are better than others if experiencing constipation versus if experiencing diarrhea. Um, so I can help you one-on-one -on -one to make um, your meal plan more individualized. Um, one thing to note is that there is more research right now, as um, Dr. Brown mentioned, on uh, CFTR modulators, specifically with uh, Simdaco and how it can potentially aid um, in weight gain and improve um, GI symptoms. So more to come on that. Um, and on enzymes a little bit, 80% um, of us um, with CF over time become pancreatic insufficient and need enzymes to, uh, to break down carbs, protein, and fats in your food. Um, so if you are pancreatic insufficient, um, if you're forgetting or if you're incon inconsistent with taking enzymes at a meal or snack, uh, we may experience um, weight loss from lack of calorie absorption um, as well as some different types of GI symptoms. So just keep an eye out on that and we can go over if the dose is correct for you. 
Um, or on the flip side, if getting too high of a dose, we may experience other GI symptoms, potentially constipation, bloating, and over time it may da damage the colon, so just be aware of um, taking the right dose. We also want to take our fat-soluble vitamins if you're prescribed um, at the same time that you're taking your enzymes um, for absorption. Um, I listed some food options here that can make it a little easier since we absorb um, nutrients best from our food. Um, so it's important to get a good balanced diet. Um, but just some reasons based on um, these specific vitamins. Uh, vitamin A can help vision, skin, healing process of wounds. Vitamin D can help bone repair, boost immunity, lower blood pressure. Vitamin E can improve blood circulation, slow age the aging process and has um, heart and brain benefits and vitamin K, we, as many of us know, aid in uh, blood clotting, um, but also bone metabolism and nerve signaling. Um, so it's, and it's also yeah. another point, um, helpful to get these vitamins and calories by supplementing your diet with nutritional shakes. Um, that may al also be an option um, with insurance paying for it. Um, many of us may also qualify for health wealth grants to aid in purchasing certain supplements, medications, and snacks. So um, if you want to follow up with us on that, if you have more questions, um, so that way you can just get in enough nutrients throughout the day. Um, another note, um, we also don't want to forget about important minerals in addition to fat-soluble vitamins, um, such as sodium. We lose a lot of salt in our sweat. Iron, a lot of us are anemic, um, which is common in CF. Um, consider calcium with, for bone concerns. Um, zinc, is, if we're deficient, this often is linked to lower lung function and bone disease in CF. Lastly, we may uh, want to consider taking a probiotic over the counter to balance good and bad bacteria. Uh, many of us are taking that, which can help. Um, and the last point, uh, we want to keep in mind the importance of your yearly oral glucose tolerance test. Um, we may think our body uh, will warn us if we have fluctuating blood sugars um, through you know, weight changes or dizziness urination, but um, oftentimes these symptoms are subtle. Um, so the sooner we can find out if we need to manage blood sugars um, through insulin, nutrition, exercise, or, you know, of course, checking our blood sugars, um, the better um, our health outcomes may be. All right. Ma'am. Melissa. Ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Is there a question? Are, are you guys going to, yeah, are you guys going to be, so I, we didn't want to interrupt, so we've been typing questions into the chat bar. Are you guys going to be addressing questions at any point? Yes. Sorry. Um, we will be discussing questions at the end. Thank you for, for asking. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Um, so one of the most fascinating things, I think, in my years of um, attending the CF conference were, uh, were the three plenaries. And actually, the CF Foundation just released all of those. So in the event anybody um, has, would like to view any of the three plenaries, um, I would be more than happy to direct you. But um, this slide in particular was a pretty powerful slide. Um, I, uh, so when I saw this, um, uh, one of our coaches for our quality improvement team basically sent me this slide because I thought I could not replicate it any better. Um, so essentially, uh, it, it, a co-productive partnership is definitely between the entire CF care team. So even though you might not see the dietitian and social worker at each visit, it doesn't mean that they're um, just as important as Dr. Brown, um, Dr. King, or whatever physician you may see and myself. Um, but ultimately, the big spheres that you see here um, are the, uh, says the healthcare professionals, and then the smaller spheres are the patients, uh, family members, and caregivers. So moving left to right, everything starts with communication. And ultimately, like we are doing right now with this webinar, you are actively listening and tuning in. Um, and, and that in turn, we do that in, during your appointments um, uh, as you guys come into clinic. So. And then uh, what, how, moving next, to, so after listening, we, we consult with you. And uh, again, if, if patients don't consult with us and seek our, um, our help in trying to live the best life possible, then, um, then we're, you know, we're not benefiting. Nobody is, essentially. And in, in tune, um, that, that requires pa patients to engage. And ultimately, it's just a, a partnership. <laughs> Um, one of the other uh, fascinating things that we learned um, was the future of research. So the CF Foundation um, is committing $100 million over the next five years to the Infection Research Initiative. Um, and in turn, essentially, they want to start developing new treatments, uh, which would then hopefully lead to optimizing current treatments, understanding more of the CF microorganisms, whether it be viral, bacterial, or fungal. And then they evaluating long-term use of antimicrobials, 
and then it essentially just improving detection and diagnosis, which is very exciting, and, and that way we can give you the biggest bang for your buck um, in terms of in the event that patients get sick and they need um, any type of antibiotic, antifungal, or antiviral, um, that we're giving you the best treatment possible. Um, and then essentially other sessions I attended, um, uh, and these are more patient specific, so I'm happy to go over any of this stuff with patients um, that any of these may apply. But it's one of the first one is pain management, and one of the most interesting facts was uh, that I learned was tramadol is the most common prescribed pain medication. And then in terms of non-pharmacologic non -ph agents, there's strong uh, evidence with uh, aerobic exercises. So whether that's strength training, yoga, tai chi, and then cogn cognitive behavior therapy as well and during the pain management process. So, and as um, Quinn mentioned earlier, we applied to the physical therapy grant. So in addition to our fabulous pulmonary rehab program, um, if we can uh, are able to take advantage of the, this physical therapy grant, if we're given that, um, that, given that uh, privilege, then we will be utilizing a physical therapist during those sessions as well, and uh, definitely receive their input and hoping that this can manage individual pains. And then last but not least, all right, excuse me, sorry, uh, the non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, uh, I just, I've, I've always found that fascinating. Um, and it's essentially, it's another type of infection that is discovered with the sputum culture. And when, so therefore I am after patients of always getting sputum cultures in clinic. Um, so in the event that patients are un unable to give a sputum culture and we do a throat swab, unfortunately we cannot run an AFB culture um, uh, because it's strictly um, run, ran off of uh, the sputum in and of itself. Um, but uh, NTM or the non-tuberculosis mycobacterium is essentially a bacteria that is found in the environment. So whether it's soil or, or tap water, um, and it can definitely damage the lungs. So that's why we're, we want to pay attention to that. Um, and we can t detect NTM um, on that, again, that, that sputum culture and essentially um, if we do a throat swab, then uh, we can't do that. So just to reiterate that. Um, and they discuss various treatment options for those individuals who um, they need to initiate treatment and goals for the healthcare provider. So uh, in the event that patients have NTM, um, we've, we've definitely utilized uh, their recommendations. So. And then the last one um, is lung transplant. Several members of our team, uh, I think, I feel like everybody attended this session. And Lauren Marinak, um, our nurse practitioner, will provide more details from this session specifically. And with that being said, I will hand it over to Elizabeth Davies Wellborn, our social worker. Hello again. Um, so a lot of the different sessions that I went to um, at NAS, NACFC um, really were designed for kind of my own professional development as a social worker, um, which then hopefully correlates into better care um, for you as patients. Um, but there were just a few things I kind of wanted to highlight. Um, the first was that in a lot of the sessions I went to, um, there was an emphasis on the importance of multidisciplinary um, approach to care. And this kind of touches on things that have already been said. You know, Melissa talking about the co-production, the importance of everyone working together, Quinn talking about PT. Um, so CF centers are really thinking kind of outside the box um, when it comes to the care team. I mean, typically when you think of multidisciplinary, you think of the doctor, the nurse, the nurse practitioner, the social worker, the dietitian, the respiratory therapist, um, which that seems like a lot. <laughs> um, but places on centers are starting to include um, a lot of other team members, um, including GI, physical therapy, palliative care. Um, and the whole idea is to focus on creating a partnership between all the different team members rather than a transition from one provider or team member to the other. Um, and by doing that, hopefully we are creating more of an environment for co-production that Melissa talked about um, just a little while ago, um, but also creating feelings of mutual respect between team members and patients. Um, and I'd like to think that by doing that, you help reduce anxiety in patients as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that the CF Foundation and those that developed the conference really have a commitment to mental health. Um, I went to a number of sessions on motivational interviewing, um, suicide assessment, 
acceptance and commitment therapy, which is also referred to as ACT. Um, I went to um, a uh, workshop on anxiety, talking about anxiety at different times of transition, um, and not just at your typical transitions from pediatrics to adult center or, um, you know, from high school to college, but for childhood um, transitions, going back to school, um, adult transitions of going to work, having a family. So I really appreciated that. Um, and then to talk just a little bit more about acceptance and commitment therapy, because it is something that is new to me. Um, so I figure it's probably um, new to everyone else as well. Um, ACT can be particularly helpful in targeting symptoms of depression and anxiety and the impact that they have on a person's life. The focus is on helping an individual identify their values and obstacles, and then helping them to learn ways to deal with the emotional effects of depression and anxiety so they can more um, effectively kind of conserve their energy and have energy and time to do the things they want to do instead of focusing on, um, on kind of those mental health concerns. Uh, there was an adult program at Drexel University that developed an ACT protocol for their patient population. It's six sessions and it focuses on the different aspects of ACT. Um, if this is something that anyone is kind of interested in learning more about, um, I'm happy to do that with you as um, I kind of go through the process myself. Um, and then also, during one of the plenaries, it was brought up that the patient and family experience of care survey has been shortened from 52 to 30 questions. Uh, this survey is a collaboration between the CF Foundation and Quality Data Management, or QDM, um, and it's designed to help centers improve the care they provide. Uh, now that the survey is shorter um, and it takes a little less time to finish, uh, we would like to take advantage of that opportunity here at ANOVA. Um, so soon, we will be sending out information to, um, to all of you, our patients, about this. Participation is optional and confidential. You can opt out at any time. And surveys are typically sent out just two times a year, usually following a clinic visit. So we ask that if you do receive information or ask to participate, that you consider it because it really helps us improve the care that we provide to um, you, our patients. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce Lauren Mernick. Hello. So the first thing I would like to talk about is IV antibiotics. And I went to a session that did a debate on whether IV antibiotics should be um, given in the inpatient setting or best given in the outpatient setting. So just an update, the most common organism in adults remains pseudomonas, and the most common organism in children is MSSA, which is methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. And there's two indications for admission for IV antibiotic therapy. The first one is a decrease in FEV1 by 10% despite optimized therapy outpatients, such as trying oral antibiotics and or increasing airway clearance, but still not feeling better. And then the second indication would be a decrease in FEV1 by 15% alone. There are pros and cons to treating pulmonary exacerbations in the inpatient setting as well as in the outpatient setting. So in the inpatient setting, a con would be that you have an increased risk of hospital-acquired infections, but a pro would be an increase in your FEV1 initially in the acute phase, as well as the ability to optimize other therapies, such as increasing your frequency of airway clearance because you have less interruptions, essentially, with family and other household obligations. In the outpatient setting, a pro would be an increase in your FEV1 long term, as well as improved quality of life for most patients and faster symptom relief. A con would be increased psychosocial demands while being at home. You may be faced with family, work, or household chores. And another one is that if initiated outpatient IV antibiotics, there's an increased risk of requiring retreatment within 30 days. So the main take-home point or recommendation from the conference was to initiate IV therapy in the hospital for the indications I listed above, then discharge home if medically appropriate for the duration of treatment. However, the decision should be individually based depending on multiple factors. For example, if the patient can obtain adequate sleep at home and has sufficient access to food. One of the other topics I wanted to touch on was management of advanced lung disease. So currently, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has a big initiative on advanced lung disease and management of these patients. Now that people with CF are living longer before transplant, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is working on guidelines for managing advanced lung disease for this patient population. They recommend a standardized approach to monitoring lung function and overall health. 
So annually, you can see listed here, for all patients with an FEV1 less than 40%, they recommend a six minute walk test to monitor functional capacity and need for supplemental oxygen, an echocardiogram, and an arterial blood gas. And then every three months, patients should be getting spirometry. These guidelines from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation should be published in 2019. Some other things to consider to optimize health in patients with advanced lung disease is pulmonary rehab, optimizing nutrition, treating sinus disease, and managing reflux, as well as gastric motility issues. And there's ongoing studies related to the use of medications for treating pulmonary hypertension in people with CF. The last topic I wanted to discuss was referrals for lung transplant. So the timing and indication for referrals should take place when a patient's FEV1 is less than 40%. The discussion should be taking place when the FEV1 is less than 50%. And the outcomes of lung transplantation in people with CF remain very good. So people with CF continue to have the best outcomes post-transplant when compared to other advanced lung diseases. The average age of transplant is 28 years old. CFTR modulators may prolong the time to transplant. So patients are listed in UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing, and the listing is based on LAS score. LAS stands for Lung Allocation Score. This score is calculated based on severity of lung disease, medical urgency for transplant, and expected post-transplant survival rate. Our patients' LAS scores typically range from 30 to 90, just depending on the severity of illness, and the higher numbers indicate increased severity of disease. LAS scores are often on the lower side for people with CF because it's, it is impacted more by the FVC rather than the FEV1, therefore it is difficult to reflect the severity of disease. At NACFC, they encourage programs to consider submitting exceptions when appropriate to UNOS to consider increasing a patient's LAS score. Examples that may warrant an exception include recurrent episodes of hemoptysis, frequent exacerbations, or pneumothoraces. One contraindication they did touch on at the conference was that low BMI has historically been a contraindication to transplant. However, outcome data suggests that this alone does not impact survival for people with CF post-transplant. Therefore, low BMI should not be the only reason someone is not a candidate for transplant. And then I included one picture at the bottom of my slide for the transplant games. They took place in Salt Lake City this year in 2018, and we had several patients participate on Team Virginia. And uh, I just wanted to point that out because there is life after transplant. And in two years, the transplant games will take place in New Jersey. So that's most of the information we wanted to present today for the conference. Just before we take questions, I wanted to briefly recognize some of the accomplishments of our adult program over the last year. So we received leadership and learning quality improvement program grants for 2018 and 2019, which was basically how we formed our multidisciplinary QI team, which includes a patient representative. We hired a dietitian dedicated to the CF program, who you heard from earlier, Erin, and we continued our growth with the CF-specific pulmonary rehab program. They also presented an oral and poster presentation by our team at the NACFC 2018. Goals for 2019 include providing patients with more communication, as in this webinar that we're doing today on our update, annual CF Center open house event, which our next one will take place in spring 2019, and sending out an adult program newsletter twice a year. We want to incorporate the patient experience of care survey, which was mentioned by Elizabeth. We'd like to create a patient family advisory board, start utilizing regular RT airway clearance assessments in clinic, increase CF research opportunities, and obtain additional grant funding for CF programs, such as a physical therapist, pharmacist, and hospitalist. And to conclude our PowerPoint presentation, I just wanted to point out our purpose statement for our quality improvement project and for our center, which is we are dedicated to enhancing the lives of people with cystic fibrosis by delivering innovative and individualized care in collaboration with patients and their families. And now we'll review our questions. Yeah. All right, what we'll do is we'll go through um, kind of the chat questions, and then if anyone has any questions, um, we'll take them orally as well, too. Um, and to make it so you're not staring at um, our PowerPoint presentation, I think we're going to turn our camera back on so you can see our faces. <laughs> All right, so um, the first question, it looks like um, 
It's for Dr. Brown, and it's um, questions about uh, the medication that Dr. Brown was discussing. Are there any planned studies for these drugs on post-transplant patients? We'll be double mic'd here. <laughs> um, great question. Um, right now, the those modulators have not been um, tested at all in patients after lung transplant. The primary benefit that most people get from the uh, modulator therapy is um, less pulmonary exacerbation, so getting sick less often, and then maybe a little boost to lung function. Um, as I did point out, it, it helps the chloride channels work all over the body. So for some people, maybe there's a little bit less GI symptoms like bloating, um, or maybe the, the diabetes gets a little bit easier to manage. But in general, those treatments really are benefiting lungs. And so after lung transplant, um, we have you uh, a person with CF has normal chloride channels, normal CFTR chloride channels in their lungs from the donor, and so you don't get the benefit with lung function, and um, so so generally they're not going to be necessary. We also have to consider that the medications are very very expensive, and they have drug interactions with some of the. Um, uh, immunosuppressant and antifungal medicine. So in general, we don't think we'll be using them after lung transplant, at least at this time. Okay. Next question. Let's see. I may need technical support. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the next one is for um, Aaron. And however you want. Okay, so uh, the question is, any dietary recommendations for patients with severe dios? So um, specifically, if you are experiencing constipation, whether it's from dios or um, just kind of Im impacted by um, constipation, um, with the two biggest things are hydration and food choices. So uh, making sure to be drinking even more fluids than you would typically need to, to cons consume um, for your body weight. Um, and then making sure that, um, you know, if you're able to consume more raw vegetables and um, very ripe fruits, um, if you're thinking more mushy, I know that sounds kind of gross, but like applesauce and, you know, some of the um, choices that you're having already broken down, um, that can be uh, helpful. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I can think of right now. Um, eating small meals very frequently, that's just always helpful. Um, hopefully this answered your question, but if you need um, something more specific based on what you're currently eating, I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one. Um, -on -one. I'll just expand on that, that Miralax is our friend. Um, so in addition to the dietary choices and pounding um, hydration, which, you know, coincidentally or not coincidentally, um, dios or CF-related constipation is much worse in the summertime when we're all hot and sweaty and losing more fluid. So like Aaron said, the hydration, but Miralax, um, putting the powder in um, an orange juice or, or something and drinking it routinely every single day is really important. For more severe cases, sometimes people do go lightly when they're in an episode or sometimes even go lightly, um, partial go lightly treatments um, periodically to stay regular or for sort of a colonic cleanse. So I hope that helps. Other questions? Let's see. I just see two in the chat box. Can um, Does anybody want to do an audio question? Just remember to unmute yourself. <laughs> Any questions at all, comments? OK. All right. Give it 30 more seconds. OK. All right. Okay. The other thing to remember is um, most of you have, if you got an email from Elizabeth originally about this conference, you have her email, you have Melissa's email. Send us your email questions. We're going to send out this PowerPoint so you can look at the slides. I know we talked uh, we talked quickly because we wanted to be respectful of your time and cover a lot, but go through the slides more slowly. And if there's more that we can expand upon, uh, we're happy to do so. And we really appreciate your time, and we hope this was worthwhile. We enjoyed putting it together for you. We're going to tape it. Hopefully, um, we'll figure out how to get that link out as well if, if people want to um, do the you know, a, a recorded rendition in the future. So thank you so much, and um, we'll see you soon in clinic.